At 10 a.m. on the 2nd of May, 1960, United States District Judge Louis Goodman agreed to a stay of execution in the case of Carol Chessman, convicted kidnapper, due to be executed in a few moments' time. The judge instructed his secretary to telephone San Quentin Prison to halt the execution. She got the wrong number. This was the ninth time that a stay of execution had been granted to Chessman since he had been found guilty way back in May 1948. Since then, he had been on death row in San Quentin prison for 12 years, protesting his innocence. Outside San Quentin on the morning of his execution was a large crowd of demonstrators. Many displayed their disgust at the cat and mouse game the legal system had played. Inside the prison, Carol Chessman, in his stockinged feet, was being escorted from the condemned cell through guarded doors and into the little octagonal steel room that was the San Quentin gas chamber. He was strapped into the right hand of two chairs. The cyanide pellets under it were ready to be released into a pan of acid. Across San Francisco Bay, Judge Goodman's secretary had checked the number of the prison. As she started dialing again, the door of the execution chamber was closed. The trial that led to that moment began over 12 years before. At 4.30 a.m. on Sunday, the 18th of January, 1948, a dentist named Thomas Bartle was driving south along the Pacific Coast Highway from Malibu, California, with a girl named Anne Plaskovitz. The late model Ford started to follow them, flashing a red light. Thinking that it must be the police, they stopped and a man demanded Bartle's driver's license. When he in turn asked to see identification, the man produced a gun. They gave him $15 and he drove off. Later the same day, a second couple were parked on a deserted road when a car with a red spotlight drove up beside them. The driver stole a small sum of money and drove off. On the following night, another couple were also parked overlooking the city. A light-colored Ford with a red spotlight drew up and a masked man asked for their identification. This time he forced the girl into his car and ordered her to perform sexual acts on him. She kept calm and when a car approached, she suggested that it might be the police and that he should take off the handkerchief mask. As he did so, she got a good look at his face. He let her go and the couple raced to the police. At midnight the same night, the robber took exactly one dollar off another couple who were parked off Mulholland Drive. The fourth and last holdup by the man who was to become known as the Red Light Bandit happened in the early morning of the 22nd of January, also high in the Hollywood Hills. This time the bandit pulled the girl into his car. Her boyfriend escaped and drove to the police, while the masked abductor tried to rape the girl. Unable to complete the act, he again forced his victim to perform fellatio before releasing her. The next day, after an armed robbery at Redondo Beach, a suspect car was chased and stopped. One of the men in it ran off. The police arrested him after a chase. His name was Carol Chessman, and he had a long record of petty crime. Carol Whittier Chessman had been born in 1921 in St. Joseph, Michigan. Six months later, the family moved to Glendale, California. When he was nine, tragedy struck. His mother was paralyzed in a car crash. His father twice tried to kill himself and was unable to support his family. Young Carol began to steal food to feed them. Chessman had his first brush with the law at the age of 16 when he was sent to a young offender school for car theft and burglary. He then served two terms at a youth camp for violent juvenile offenders. Over the next 11 years, he served time for car theft, robbery, assault with a deadly weapon, and assaulting a police officer. He was an unusual prisoner with an IQ of 136. He edited the San Quentin prison newspaper, taught shorthand, and wrote scripts for the prison radio station. He had been out on parole only a couple of weeks when he was arrested fleeing from the stolen car. The car fitted the description of the red light bandit's vehicle. It had a spotlight mounted by the driver's window 
and police found a red handkerchief knotted so that it would fit over this lamp and make it into a red light. What happened next remained the subject of dispute. According to the police, Chessman confessed of his own volition to being the red light bandit. But he claimed that he was brutally beaten. He insisted that he agreed to make a false confession only because in return the police would drop all charges except robbery. This was a crucial question, because contrary to the deal he thought he had made, Chessman was arraigned on 18 charges which included kidnapping. Following the abduction of Charles Lindbergh's baby son, kidnapping with bodily harm with intent to commit robbery had been made a capital offence in California whether or not anyone was killed. So if Carol Chessman were to be found guilty of forcing the two women from their car to his, he would technically be eligible for the death sentence, despite the fact that he had neither murdered or fully raped anyone. Many people felt that press reports before and during Chessman's trial inflamed public opinion by greatly exaggerating the ordeals of his victims. Between his arrest and the start of his trial on the 30th of April, 1948, Chessman hired four attorneys, among them Al Matthews. He finally represented himself, not very competently. He allowed so many prosecution errors and excesses to go unchallenged that some observers thought that he was deliberately trying to ensure a mistrial. Although he was identified by several of the victims as the red light bandit, the identification procedures were all subject to flaws. Before each lineup, the victims were shown Chessman on his own and had him pointed out to them. Some of the descriptions of the bandit fitted him, others did not. Nevertheless, the jury found him guilty on 17 counts, including three of kidnapping, and recommended the death penalty. Now began 12 years of appeals. Like a cat, Carol Chessman turned out to have nine lives, with eight stays of execution. His first attempt to save his life came in June 1948, shortly after he had been moved to San Quentin. The court reporter at his trial died before he had transcribed more than a third from his shorthand notes. Chessman appealed for a new trial because there was now no possibility of an accurate transcript. Another reporter, the brother-in-law of the prosecuting attorney, was employed to complete the job. It turned out he was an alcoholic, and in October, the Court Reporters Association protested that his transcript was unreadable. But in June 1949, the judge who had tried Chessman certified it as accurate. Chessman was not asked for his approval. For the next two years, as the United States became fascinated by the revelations of major criminals during the Kefauva inquiries, petty crook Chessman fought to prove that the transcript was so inaccurate that a new trial must be called. But in May 1951, the US Supreme Court refused to consider his case. As the nation mourned the retirement of Joe DiMaggio, Chessman's appeal was considered by a Californian court. This rejected him and set a date for execution on the 28th of March 1952. Chessman's second chance of life came in February 1952, when his execution was postponed for another referral to the US Supreme Court. But Chessman soon heard that this had been refused, and then came the devastating news that the execution would be carried out on the 27th of June. But almost immediately came another reprieve from the gas chamber when Chessman was given fresh leave to appeal his case. For the rest of 1952, while the American public thrilled to the appearance of a new hero, Hopalong Cassidy, Chessman continued his bitter and lonely fight to prove that his original trial had been faulty. But in May 1953, the US Court of Appeals turned him down. At the beginning of 1954, a third execution date was set. It now seemed that nothing could save Chessman from taking his place in the gas chamber. But then on the day before he was due to die, Chessman's lawyer, Berwin Rice, convinced California's judge Thomas Keating to agree to another stay of execution. He rushed to the prison and told Chessman, I've got some news for you, Chess. You're going to be around for a little longer, at least. Mm -hmm. 
During his three-year ordeal, Carol Chessman had changed from a bright, petty hoodlum into a literate and intelligent thinker. He had turned his cell into a study center on the law and had just published the first of three books pleading his case. This was cell 2455, Death Row. It quickly became an international bestseller and alerted the world to his plight. Over the next six years, Chessman published two more books in which he argued not only that his original trial had been deeply flawed, but that he had done nothing to deserve to be on death row. From his condemned cell, Chessman pointed out that the original identifications of him as the red light bandit had been incorrectly carried out, and that his original confession had been forced out of him. Alongside him in San Quentin were men who had committed far worse crimes but were not now facing the gas chamber. But for all his pleading, the California Supreme Court again refused to reconsider the case, and a new execution date was set for the 30th of July, 1954. For the first time, Chessman seemed totally dispirited. But again, there was a last minute reprieve, when a local judge granted a stay so that Chessman could go back to the US Supreme Court. California's Attorney General was infuriated. By now, Chessman was no longer a lonely figure fighting for his life, but a man whose struggle had gained him friends all over the world. He also now had a fiancé, Francis Couturier. Their support was sorely needed, as the seesaw legal battle continued. In June 1957, the US Supreme Court finally took the dramatic step of ordering the California courts to hold a new hearing on the whole validity of the original court transcripts. For the first time, it was ordered that Carol Chessman must be present at the hearing. He was taken to the state Supreme Court accompanied by the new attorneys that the income from his books had enabled him to employ. Disputes over the transcripts dragged on for another two years as Chessman and his lawyers went back and forth to court. By now a new element had entered the case. California had repealed the Little Lindbergh Law under which Chessman was to be executed. An increasing number of people felt that the only legal justification for demanding the death penalty had now been removed. Chessman had been on death row for more than eight years. For many, it seemed inhumane that he should still be fighting for his life when the state legislature had decided that the original law under which he had been condemned could no longer be justified. It had also granted parole eligibility to everyone else who had been convicted under it. But the court took the view that it must concentrate solely on the technical legal point on the transcripts and not take any broader issues into account. On the 7th of July, 1959, Chessman's attorneys, Rosalie Asher and George Davis, were advised that the California Supreme Court had decided that the transcript was substantially correct, even though 2,000 changes were inserted for the record. A new execution date was set for the 24th of October, 1959. After a reprieve of four years, Chessman was again faced with a definite date for execution. But he announced his determination to fight on. His case was now being followed all over the world. There were protest meetings in many capitals. An international petition was set up and signed by more than two million people. Even in nations which had not abandoned the death penalty at that time, like Britain or France, there was astonishment that a man could have been kept waiting for so many years. In Italy, the newspaper Osservatore Romano wrote, anyone who has to wait 11 years for the gas chamber has expiated his guilt. Famous names who lent their support included Pope John XXIII, Albert Schweitzer, Eleanor Roosevelt, Queen Fabiola of Belgium, Pablo Casals, Shirley MacLaine, and Marlon Brando. 
Faced with this pressure, California's Governor Edmund Brown announced that he was considering the appeals. But local political reaction proved too strong. And on the 19th of October, 1959, he refused to grant clemency. Thirty years later, in his book, Public Justice, Private Mercy, Brown wrote, Chessman was a nasty, arrogant, unrepentant man, almost certainly guilty of the crimes he was convicted of. But I don't think those crimes deserve the death penalty. Governor Brown's experience with Chessman had planted the seeds of doubt about the effectiveness of the death penalty. As I moved along and I found, and I watched the people that killed, I concluded it didn't do any good that these people would kill whether you had uh, capital punishment or not. For the state to do it, it seemed to me that it cheapened the life of, uh, of everybody. The effect on the officials involved also concerned him. I, I never knew whether I did right. And that's a terrible responsibility, even though the jury and the courts have all decided he should die. Nevertheless, the petitions may have played a part in persuading U.S. Supreme Court Justice Douglas to agree to another appeal to the Supreme Court. But it was to little avail, and on the 11th of January, 1960, the court again refused to consider the case. A new execution date was set for the 19th of February. But in an unexpected new twist, with only one day to go, Governor Brown granted a 60-day reprieve. He also announced that he would be recommending the abolition of the death penalty in California. The battle lines were now drawn up on this new attempt to find a solution. Yet again, Chessman found himself back in his cell to await events. Even more extraordinarily, it was now announced that Chessman would be allowed to hold a televised press conference. Smartly dressed, he was asked whether he was now going for broke. I believe I have been all along. There is no effort to. At one point, there was a willingness on my part when a great many friends prevailed on me to consider accepting a commutation of sentence. And when that was rejected and made a political issue, why I have decided since then that I'm either going to survive and be vindicated and walk the streets a free man, or I'm going to wind up dead. What if you were to secure your release tomorrow? What would be the first thing you'd do on the outside? Do you have any idea? I'd probably take a good long look at the sky when there wasn't any bars around. A journalist then wanted to know whether he had ever lost hope. Well, I don't know if I ever actually had hope. It's like a soldier out in the field, the battlefield. I don't know if he has hope or not. He just keeps slogging forward as much as possible and uh, then waits for the results. Whether the shell might hit him, well, in the same way, in a legal sense, the shell might have hit me and that would have been the end of me. Chessman was then asked how many people had been executed in California while he waited on death row. I believe before I left San Quentin, it was... 75 men and one woman. I had heard that each one of these affected you quite strongly. Well, it did, of course, in the sense that I saw a man walk by my cell and he never returned, and I had occasion to reflect on the fact that it often wasn't murder that was a capital offense, it was ignorance, or the fact that the man was fundless or friendless, You'd see, read in the paper, where someone perhaps was more fortunate and would get a conviction for second-degree murder on what might be an identical set of facts that would put someone else in the gas chamber. I don't feel that there's anything equitable or fair or sensible or socially valid about capital punishment. Even when asked how he now felt, he reacted with dignity. I don't feel about it. I've gone beyond the point of feeling. You don't react subjectively after 10 years. How can you? You don't have the capacity to feel anymore. By now, Chessman had learnt not to raise his hopes too high. And his caution was justified when the State Senate Judiciary Committee confounded his attorney, George Davis's hopes, by refusing to consider the death penalty abolition bill.
after more than 11 years in the shadow of the gas chamber and a total of eight stays of execution, Chessman still protested his innocence. But more importantly now, he felt that he was fighting to make a contribution to a more humane society. The petty crook who had begun his long struggle defiantly and bitterly was now hoping that his example would lead to the abolition of capital punishment. That night, protesters gathered outside the prison for a final vigil. By the morning set for Chessman's execution, their numbers had been increased by newsmen from all over the world. Chessman's attorneys were making their last pleas to get another stay. Security at the prison was tight, and all other prisoners had been confined to their cells until the execution, due at 10 o'clock, was completed. As 10 o'clock approached, Chessman's attorneys succeeded in persuading Judge Goodman that there were new arguments that should be considered. As the final minutes ticked away, the judge instructed his secretary to get the prison. She dialed its number, GL4-1460, but she got a wrong number, and precious seconds were wasted as she dialed again. Meanwhile, Chessman had been taken from his cell and led the short distance to the gas chamber. He walked unaided into the metal box and was strapped into the right-hand chair. Even as the judge's secretary got through to the prison governor, the cyanide pellets had dropped into the acid bowl. All the judge could do was turn to George Davis and say, it's too late, the pellets have been dropped. Defiant to the last, Carol Chessman held his breath for one last extra minute before ending his 12-year ordeal. Coming up, the story of a two-year rampage during which a sadistic killer raped, mutilated and murdered his way across California. The extraordinary story of Richard Ramirez, Night Stalker. Saturday's Great Crimes and Trials double continues straight after the break. Mm -hmm.